I wanted to ask Dr. Lydia uh, two quick questions. One is in relation to um, children who, have our, who are here who are existing already born through surrogacy. You mentioned that in your document. If you could expand a little bit briefly on how we can, because I think we really have a responsibility as legislators that this, this element anyway has been going on for far too long. There's a, a whole bunch of children not recognised and it's not right. And I, I, we think we really need to, to act on that. So um, if you could tell us a little bit more about how you see that kind of playing out. And then I've really become kind of fixated on the pre-birth, post-birth, at-birth parentage um, situation. I, I've put my cards on the table and I've said it since the start. I think the pre-birth uh, model is, is the best one. Um, you say for international, Dr. Lydia, post-birth, do you mean at birth? Because for all of the various reasons that we could consistently hear around, you know, potential medical issues and who's going to take responsibility for that, I just see that there's lots of difficulties around the post-birth. And I think if you have a good system that's done correctly, pre-birth is the way forward. Um, and then I might come back in for questions for Garrod and Shane, but I do just want to say, I really appreciate you being here, sharing your personal stories and uh, very best of luck to Shane as well on his own journey. Thanks, Chair. Thank okay, so Dr. Bracken, if you want to come in on that. Yeah, so the, the first question was in relation to children who've already been born through surrogacy. And I would very strongly argue that that needs to be prioritized in yeah. the legislation. You know, we have so many children living in Ireland who've been born through surrogacy and their family relationships are not currently recognized and they're left in a really undesirable position of not having a legal relationship or a permanent legal relationship with both of their parents. So it, it absolutely needs to, to be addressed. Um, what I have proposed is that a model similar to something like the um, Children and Family Relationships Act, sections 20 to 22, which currently allow for those retrospective declarations of parentage to be made in cases of DAHR that, under, that were undertaken prior to the commencement of the legislation. Um, something similar with the necessary adoptions could be used very successfully in um, the context of children who've already been born through surrogacy. Um, so it would allow the um, intending parents to apply to court for this declaration of parentage to recognise um, either or perhaps both of the intending parents who are not currently recognised as legal parents, provided that certain proofs are um, are given to the, the court. Um, it appears to be a relatively straightforward process in the context of DAHR, and, and so I would argue that it should be a, a very simple process for uh, surrogacy as well, in respect of surrogacy that's already been uh, taken place. And I suppose we have the, the kind of model for it within sections 20 to 22 of the, the Children and Family Relationships Act. So, so that's the, the model model that I would propose for uh, the retrospective recognition of parentage. Um, in relation to the, the pre-birth or the post-birth um, mm. recognition of parentage, I suppose I create the distinction between um, domestic surrogacy, which I think can be facilitated through the preconception approach, and international surrogacy, for which I think a post-birth approval process makes sense, simply on the basis that it would be very difficult for the state to kind of sanction in advance parentage which has been established through a procedure that's been undertaken abroad. That's not to say that it, it couldn't happen, so perhaps an application during the pregnancy might be possible. However, I feel that the post-birth transfer of parentage in international surrogacy allows the Irish courts to check that certain ethical safeguards have been adhered to all the way through um, the pregnancy up until the birth of the child. It's not a perfect system by any means because it does mean that when the child is born for the purpose of Irish law, they might not um, have that, that legal recognition in terms of uh, the relationship with the intending parents. But uh, I suppose what I have proposed is that where the intending parents are both listed on the foreign birth certificate, that we might have kind of a, a fast track um, application in Ireland um, whereby they can obtain a parental order recognising both of them as legal parents and the application would be granted unless it is fundamentally contrary to an agreed ethical framework for surrogacy within Ireland. But having the post-birth um, judicial process allows for 
you know, scrutiny of the ethical standards to ensure that we're maintaining the integrity of the ethical framework um, and ensuring that, that recognition is based on it. But it also allows for um, consideration of the best interests of the child in that uh, process as well. So, so that's primarily the reason why I think a post-birth process in, in terms of the international arrangement um, would uh, be the more appropriate way forward. But in domestic surrogacy, I support the, the preconception transfer of parentage. Okay, thank you very much. And did you have a question for Gerolden? Yeah, Shane? if we had more time, I would have had more questions for Lydia too, because I just, I've, I wonder about the, like that still leaves people in a limbo in terms of medical decisions and stuff post-birth. And like, is there a way of having a pre-birth, but like, um, subject to kind of three months, I don't know what the right phrase is, but you know, if something was to go wrong, that it could be reneged, but that it's there, if that, if that makes sense. But I don't think we have time, unfortunately, to, to go into all of that, but I just wanted to, to put that out there. I think, I just think that there's a lot of complications if it's, if it's post-birth and we're kind of still stuck in kind of the same situation that we're currently in, which I think we're trying to move away from. I just wanted to ask about the Canadian situation. I heard Mary asked earlier, and that was one of my questions, um, because I've been looking into that one as well. I know Garod has mentioned that last week and also when you came before the Children's Committee. So um, if there was any other additional information, and then the point that you made about potentially having a surrogate um, on, listed on the long birth cert, would you see that as an optional process? Because I'm conscious that there will be very many surrogates who don't actually want to be on the birth cert, they don't see that, that role for themselves. So would you say that, that you think, think that's an optional process? Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, so in terms of additional information on Canada, I mean, um, I suppose the, the, the point I'd make is that in the next couple of weeks, you will have solicitors attending uh, before the committee from the Canadian system. And I would, I think they would be able to give you far more information. My experience of Canada was as somebody who tried and failed to have a child for unknown reasons through the Canadian system. Um, so I think they would be better placed to give you more insight than I could. Um, in terms of the long form of the birth cert, um, that is a good question. I mean, what happens in the United States and Canada is that the couple have the option, the intended parents that is, when the child is born, that they as the intended parents, regardless of their gender, can go on the birth cert and the surrogate does not need to appear in the birth cert. In the UK, as I mentioned, the surrogate must appear in the birth cert. She's the legal mother at the point of birth and therefore must be on the birth cert. I, we, uh, we encourage our members to discuss every aspect of a surrogacy journey with their surrogate prior to the commencement. Yeah. And if it's required by local law to make an agreement, to make that agreement, if it's just not required, as is the case in the UK, to still have some form of agreement and to discuss with the surrogate what will happen when it comes to the issuing of a birth cert. Mm. Currently, most couples, regardless of what's available in Canada and the United States, when they go there, will put the surrogate and ask the surrogate to be named on the birth cert, simply because when they come back to Ireland, having a birth cert that lists two men, um, as the intended pair, as the actual parents, excuse me, doesn't work for Irish institutions like the passport office. Um, so we encourage we encourage all our members to discuss this really important issue as to how the birth cert is going to look. Of course, if the option is there to include the details on the long form of the birth certificate, that should be another aspect of the discussion between the intended parents and the surrogate. And clearly, it is better if the surrogate is willing to be a participant in that and to, to have her name listed on the birth cert. Um, but the current reason for having a, a surrogate listed on a birth cert, a surrogate mother listed on a birth cert that's issued in the United States and Canada is simply because when you come back to Ireland, it makes life easier if it looks like a normal birth cert. Okay. Thanks very, very much, much, Chair, and thanks for the presentations. Like um, Senator Siri Carney, I just want to acknowledge in particular, the role of the Department of Foreign Affairs over the last few weeks has been incredibly difficult. And also, actually, to acknowledge Senator Siri Kearney, because for some of us who were navigating it for the first time as well, we were just as much on the phone to her, um, and she was always available. So I think that, that does need to be acknowledged. And you're dealing with families in very difficult situations, and there was always so much, um, I suppose, care and sensitivity given, so just to say that. Um, part of my question actually leads on from what, what Trevor just, just said there in relation to, you know, if there was some sort of a set of guidelines or 
like we're dealing with this, the, the, the pre-birth, post-birth, at-birth parentage, um, transfer of parentage. I, I'm kind of focusing a lot on that because I, I find, I think that's going to be the crux of a lot of it. If the, we had a pre-birth um, parentage model here, would that make the situation easier? And for example, and I know nobody uh, envisaged what happened in the Ukraine, nobody could have seen what was going to happen there, but would that have made some of those situations easier or more straightforward, if that makes sense, if that had been in place? Um, or does it not really change anything for Department of Foreign Affairs? Is your role still going to be the same? And then the other question I have is, um, when Department of Justice were last in with health and children, we were asking about potential other models that people have seen internationally that, that they might um, look at or think were, were good practice. Um, I don't know if if since the last time you, you've looked at any other models um, or maybe heard some of the stuff about the Canadian model in the earlier session and just out of interest for Department of Foreign Affairs because you're dealing with so many countries, is there one that you think, you know, maybe not better is the right word, but is there one, is there other systems or examples that you think work well? Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Who do you want to go to first? Um, foreign Affairs, I think, please, and then Justice. Um, well, I suppose, in terms of the models, I don't think we would. I mean, I think it's important to, I mean, we have a certain role and a certain outward, you know, outward facing experience, but the policy is, is not with us. So um, we wouldn't really be looking at the models in, in that sense. So I think we would defer to others on that. Um, um, in terms of um, the, the experiences that we've had to date, um, again, I think we can say from our department's perspective, there would obviously be a benefit to us um, if there is a, a pre-arrangement um, process that brings legal certainty. But that's just from the perspective of our own department. That's not to say that should obviously be the yeah. policy. And I think that's just one factor that the committee may wish to, to bear in mind. Can I just ask, would, it, sorry, would that mean that the, would there be still a need for the emergency travel document or does it mean that it could be kind of issued faster? Like, is there any practical examples of how it would be easier or better for your department? And I understand you're only speaking on, on behalf of your own department, like. I think, again, we would say we, it's hard to envisage, you know, the abstract, but I mean, the key, I think the key difficulty that we have is applying guidelines in, in new circumstances where we, as, as has been mentioned, we need to examine the law in that country um, and the notice that we may have of a birth may be relatively um, short, so it does put pressure on the department and it does seek that. And the law in those countries might be quite unclear itself. If you're dealing with a country where surrogacy is unregulated, you might get a legal advice that itself has ambiguity. So from those perspectives, the department is in a difficult position occasionally. Um, where, to just give us an example, if there was a regulatory agency in Ireland that was responsible for looking at jurisdictions and providing advice um, one could see that that may, may take some burden off, off uh, the Department of Foreign okay. Affairs where, we're, where, where we come across those situations, um, as I said, uh, uh, potentially at short notice, so that may be a benefit to us. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And Department of Justice? Yeah, I mean, in, in, in terms of models for recognition of international surrogacy, it's, it's an issue that countries, in, uh, countries across the world, and in, in Europe in particular, have been, have, 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 have been have, have had to deal with in, in, in especially in recent years. Um, we're not aware of any particular country that has has found a specific specific model or a specific legislative framework. To the best of our knowledge, mo mo most countries that, that most countries deal deal with this in the in the in the in their existing family law framework. Um, ad adoption in particular has has um, has has, um, has been used as 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 as, as a route to um, as, as as a route to parentage in in, in international surrogacy cases, um, particularly in, in 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 European jurisdictions. Um, I mean, in, in terms of a pre-birth or post-birth model. Um, the DHR bill provides for a two-step process in relation to surrogacy taking place in Ireland, um, the, the, the preconception stage and then the, the post-birth parental order. So it, 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 it may be that some, if, if uh, it, a, a, a pre-birth a pre approval may, you know, may, may not in itself be sufficient, but I think, again, that's, it's, it's, it's getting into questions of policy there. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, sorry, you want to come in, uh, Miss Van? 
Sure, I just, um, just to come back really, I suppose, on the ETC process from the parents' point of view yeah. and our experience of you know, how long it can take and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, so to take Ukraine for example, which was quite, uh, quite a, um, uh, a large volume of our applications came through Ukraine, Ukraine prior to, to the war breaking out. Um, and we had an, a resident embassy there, and so um, applications were taking about three to six weeks to be to be processed following the birth of the child. There are a number of documents that cannot be put together until until the child is born, um, and we are also dependent on the Ukrainian authorities and their processes and how long it takes, uh, or, or the uh, or the authorities of any country um, that we're in. But the, but. Um, so it was taking about three to six weeks after the baby was born in in, in that jurisdiction. Um, again, as we've as we've mentioned, if it's a new jurisdiction where we have we haven't had an ETC pro, um, application in the past, it can take um, quite considerable um, time to put the process in place and to ensure that all the documents meet our standards. Um, so I think it's really important from the parents' point of view that they engage in the process early, um, uh, as we often only hear about the birth after the fact. Um, and are aware that they're in country waiting for, for the baby, um, but we may not hear about it until af and after okay. the fact. So I think it is important for parents to, to really, and I know they get legal advice locally and, and, um, and here in Ireland, and as, as, as they should, and we advise them to do that, but they should do a lot of research around what, what is, is, is involved and talk to others maybe who've been through the process and um, just be aware of, of what's involved and, and um, you know, be prepared um, for, for the the level of paperwork and maybe the time that it might take um, because you know sometimes I don't think they are aware of actually what's involved in it once um, yeah. the baby is born um, so that's that would be from our point of view I think that would help to manage um, the work on our side if parents were, were, were fully aware of, of the situation. Mm.